Welcome back, dear friends, to another exciting episode of the Dispensation of Baha'u'llah. We are on part 12, covering paragraphs 30 through 35. Thank you so much, and without any further ado, we'll have our opening prayer. Thank you. I beg of thee, O oh my God, by thy most exalted word, which thou hast ordained as the divine elixir unto all who are in thy realm, the elixir through whose potency the crude metal of human life hath been transmuted into purest gold, O thou in whose hands are both the visible and invisible kingdoms, to ordain that my choice be conformed to thy choice and my wish to thy wish that I may be entirely content with, with that which thou didst desire and be wholly satisfied with what thou didst destine for me by thy bounteousness and favor. Potent art thou to do as thou willest. Thou in very truth art the all glorious, the all wise. Baha'u'llah. Beautiful, Miss Darla. Thank you so much. And welcome back to each and every one of you. And thank you so much for being in our company tonight. So let us get into our study. So dear friends, we are studying the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. This is found in the World Order of Baha'u'llah, the selected letters. Um, we're on paragraph 30. That's where we're starting tonight. Um, if you can find that on page 110. Okay, so let me share my screen so you can all be, as they say, on the same page. Okay, here we go. Okay, and here we are. Excellent. So we're covering paragraphs 30 through 35 tonight. Okay. One of the interesting uh, paragraphs in this set, as they say, is uh, mentions the four seasons of a revelation. This is a very interesting com uh, um, very interesting um, where His Holiness Abdul Baha mentions that we are in the summer season in the, in the summer season, at the height of this um, uh, revelation. And so I want to show you um, where it's uh, Abdul Baha talks about the different seasons of a revelation. This is very interesting and to learn about, okay? As well as um, talking about this holy cycle, the Baha'i cycle. We've talked about this before in past uh, class where the Baha'i cycle lasts how many centuries, anyone? 500,000. It's 500,000 years. That's right, dear Tesfais. 500,000 years. So we're going to talk about the holy cycle, the Baha'i cycle, in, as well as in this incredible, incredible paragraph, um, which every time I read this, this is one of my as they say, top favorite paragraphs in Dispensation of Baha'u'llah is paragraph 35, is this incredible paragraph, and I is this paragraph that the beloved guardian uh, is quoting, and uh, the urgency of the hour in which we live, the urgency of our action, it demands action. Okay, so this comes in paragraph 35. Okay, so these are the main themes that we're going to be reading in uh, coming up in these paragraphs. So without any further ado, as they say, I'll read the first one and then we'll go around. Okay, so let me start this off. Okay, this over here. Here we go. Paragraph 30. Such is dearly beloved friends. Baha'u'llah's own written testimony to the nature of his revelation, to the affirmations of the Bab, each of which reinforces the strength and confirms the truth of these remarkable statements. I have already referred 
What remains for me to consider in this connection are such passages in the writings of Abdul Baha, the appointed interpreter of these same utterances, as throw further light upon and amplify various features of this enthralling theme. The tone of his language is indeed as emphatic and his tribute no less glowing than that of either Baha'u'llah or the Bab. So in the, just very briefly, in this paragraph is now uh, the beloved guardian saying, we've already covered the, the, His Holiness Baha'u'llah and we've already covered the Bab statements um, addressing to the greatness of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Now let's us turn to the writings of Abdul Baha, the appointed interpreter of these uh, same utterances. And let us look at the writings of Abdul Baha as they throw further light upon and amplify various features of this enthralling theme. What is this enthralling theme? It is the greatness and uniqueness of this revelation of Hawla. And then uh, the beloved God says, the tone of his language is indeed as emphatic and his tribute no less glowing than that of either Baha'u'llah or the Blessed Baha. Okay, so this is paragraph 30. Let us carry on. Okay, our next reader is going to be, let us have, dear Mary, if you could uh, kindly read this one for us. Paragraph 31. Are you, we can't hear you, dear Mary. I know you're unmuted, but we still can't hear you. Must be some audio difficulties. Nothing still, sorry. Eh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we're going to go, so I apologize, dear Mary. Okay, let us go to Zamru Hijan. There you are, you're up next. <clears throat> Centuries, nay, ages must pass away, he affirms in one of his earliest tablets, ere the day star of truth shineth again in its midsummer splendor, or appeareth once more in the radiance of its vernal glory. How thankful must we, must we be for having been made in this day the recipients of so overwhelming a favor. Would that we had 10,000 lives that we might lay down, lay them down in thanksgiving for so rare a privilege, so high an attainment, so priceless a bounty. The mere contemplation, he adds, of the dispensation inaugurated by the blessed beauty would have sufficed to overwhelm the saints of bygone ages, saints who long to partake for one moment of its great glory. The holy ones of past ages and centuries have each and all yearned with tearful eyes to live, though for one moment in the day of God. Their longing unsatisfied, they repair to the great beyond. How great therefore is the bounty of the Abha beauty who notwithstanding our utter unworthiness, had, through his grace and mercy, breathed into us in this divinely illumined century, the spirit of life, had gathered us beneath the standard of the beloved of the world, and chosen to confer upon us a bounty for which the mighty ones of bygone ages had craved in vain. The souls of the well-favored among the concourse on high, he likewise affirms, the sacred dwellers of the most exalted paradise are in this day filled with burning desire to return unto this world that they may render such service as lieth in their power to the threshold of the Abha beauty. Beautifully read. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just these are the words of Abdul Baha, as you recall, because in paragraph, uh, the prior paragraph, paragraph 30, is that these are the words of Abdul Baha that we're hearing now. 
glorifying, uh, glorifying this revelation of Baha'u'llah. And this last uh, statement is so profound. The sacred dwellers of the most exalted paradise are in this day filled with burning desire to return unto this world. <laughs> they want to return unto this world for what? For what reason? That they may render such service as lieth in their power to the threshold of the Abha beauty. Ah. So let's go to paragraph 32. We're going to recap all of this in much greater detail. So let's just go to paragraph 32. Okay. Our next reader is dear Miss Marianne. Miss Marianne, if you could be so kind. Okay. <clears throat> the effulgence of God's splendorous mercy, he in a passage alluding to the growth and future development of the faith declares, has enveloped the peoples and kindreds of the earth, and the whole world is bathed in its shining glory. The day will soon come <clears throat> when the light of divine unity will have so permeated the East and the West that no man dare any longer ignore it. Now in the world of being, the hand of divine power has firmly laid the foundations of this all highest bounty and this wondrous gift. Whatsoever is latent in the innermost of this holy cycle shall gradually appear and be made manifest. For now is but the beginning of its growth <clears throat> and the day spring of the revelation of its signs. Ere the close of this century and of this age, it shall be made clear and evident how wondrous was that springtide. Oh, well, <laughs> I don't have any more on my screen. Oh, sorry. How wondrous was that springtide? And how heavenly was that gift? Excellent. Thank you. Very beautifully read. Thank you, Miss Marianne. All right. Okay. And let us go to paragraph 33. Rios, John, could you read this for us? Yes. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you. From the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, paragraphs under study, paragraph 33. In confirmation of the exalted rank of the true believer referred to by Baha'u'llah, he reveals the following. The station which he who hath truly recognized this revelation will attain is the same as the one ordained for such prophets of the house of Israel as are not regarded as manifestations endowed with constancy. Excellent. Thank you, dear Rios John. And let's move to 34. All of these we're going to reflect on and go deeper into. But let us first read the paragraphs so we could hear them. Okay. Doug, could you read this paragraph 34 for us? Thank you. 
in connection with the manifestations destined to follow the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha makes this definite and weighty declaration concerning the manifestations that will come down in the future in the shadows of the clouds. Know verily that in so far as their relation to the source of their inspiration is concerned, they are under the shadow of the ancient beauty. In their relation, however, to the age in which they appear, each and every one of them doeth whatsoever he willeth. Excellently read. Thank you so much. And we'll be talking about that at much greater length. Okay. And the last paragraph here. Mary, you got your voice back, as they say? Ay, 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 still can't hear you. But we see your beautiful face, I know. So either way, Miss Darla, could you read this one? Paragraph 35. There you go. Oh, my friend, he thus addresses in one of his tablets, a man of recognized authority and standing. The undying fire which the Lord of the kingdom hath kindled in the midst of the holy tree is burning fiercely in the midmost heart of the world. The conflagration it will provoke will envelop the whole earth. Its blazing flames will illuminate its peoples and kindreds. All the signs have been revealed. Every prophetic illusion hath been manifested. Whatever hath been enshrined in all the scriptures of the past hath been made evident. To doubt or hesitate is no more possible. Time is pressing. The divine charger is impatient and can tarry no longer. Ours is the duty to rush forward and ere it is too late, win the vi victory. And finally is the most stirring passage in which he, in one of his moments of exaltation, was moved to address to one of his most trusted and eminent followers in the earliest days of his ministry. What more shall I say? What else can my pen recount? So loud is the call that reverberates from the Abha kingdom that mortal ear ears are well nigh deafened with its vibrations. The whole creation, methinks, is being disrupted and is burst, uh, bursting asunder through the shattering influence of the divine summons issued from the throne of glory. More than this, I cannot write. Thank you so much, Ms. Darla. So here we are. So prior paragraphs were from the writings of, you know, this is the blessing uh, from the writings of Baha'u'llah, as well as the blessed Bob, mm -hmm. the, um, the beloved guardian is quoting them to really address this incredible revelation of Baha'u'llah. And now, in paragraph 30 through 35, um, he's uh, quoting from the writings mm. of Abdul Baha. Okay. Um, dear Rios John, you have a hand, please. Thank you. In this uh, particular, I mean, this, well, especially in the, well, this is just an example of the language in this paragraph 35. It's an example of the language that we uh, we keep seeing uh, here in the in these classes, dispensation of Baha'u'llah. Uh, for example, on line five from the bottom up, we read, so loud is the call that reverberates from the Abha kingdom, that mortal ears are well nigh deafened by its vibrations. Uh, 
I just want to express my feelings that uh, this these statements are talking about as witness as witnesses of the Abha of the Abha kingdom or the spiritual realms or the kingdom of revelation uh, in a way that we see as though they are witnessing real processes going on in the spiritual realms that's what we are that's where they are it seems they're conveying to us uh, it's it's a it's it's a dimension that we have no direct perception but the language that we are reading is as though they are witnessing for example this divine charger is impatient <clears throat> uh, the reverberations from the Abha kingdom I mean these are description like eyewitness descriptions of of real mm -hmm. real spiritual realities that they're trying to impart to us. Absolutely, Rios John. Absolutely. Um, the language here is very flowery. It is also symbolic language, and it's reminiscent of gospel language, um, in the language of the gospels, um, having that uh, language um, being very flowery is also reminiscent. If you think about the fire tablet, if um, where at the, the end of the fire tablet it says, "We have heard thy call." Remember, at the, and the face of Baha is flaming. Go forth, you know, at the end of the fire tablet. And so it says, "What else?" Uh, where he says, "Finally," and this is most stirring passage, which he in one of his is, uh, was moved to address to one of his most trusted and eminent followers in the earliest days. See, that the divine charger is impatient and can tarry no longer. Ours is the duty to rush forward. And uh, this, uh, this uh, to me, this reminds me of the fire tablet, the language, the intensity, the, um, uh, that of the call here. Um, and also, I also want to uh, relay several times this imagery of fire is already in here. This undying fire. This holy tree is burning fiercely. Okay? So fire does multiple things, even on the molecular level. Okay? What does fire do? Fire, by definition is destructive it literally is breaks things down it but what how does it do that fire is heat and flame and how it does that it cre by the heat and the intensity it energizes the atom the atoms and molecules at such an intensity that they move are moving at such an incredible uh, speed that they combust, okay? And they in themselves ignite. So what I'm saying is in this um, analogy is that through the undying fire, and what is the undying fire? It is the, the fire of Baha'u'llah, that the, the eternal flame, this is a title of Baha'u'llah, the eternal flame, the undying fire is the most great spirit, okay? Which the Lord of kingdom have kindled in the holy tree is burning fiercely in the midmost heart of the world. Okay, the conflagration it will provoke. What is this conflagration? It's by the coming of this new revelation. It will provoke, will envelop the whole earth. Remember the quote: "The world's equilibrium hath been upset." Right by the coming of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Right, all the signs have been revealed. Right, its blazing flames will, will what? will illuminate its peoples and kindreds. So its blazing flames will not destroy, but illuminate. So give light. So people will be illuminated. Illumination means knowledge. So this, per se, supposed destructive force will actually illuminate the peoples of the world. 
all the signs have been revealed. Every prophetic allusion have been manifested. Whatever have been enshrined in all the scriptures of the past have been made evident. To doubt or hesitate is no more possible. So you can't deny it. You can't doubt it. <laughs> it's as clear as stone as they say. It's, it's right there. To doubt or hesitate is no more possible. Now the beloved guardian said, time is pressing. The divine charger is impatient. Who's the, the divine charger? What is this divine charger? Anyone? What is that? That's Baha'u'llah. That's right. <laughs> the divine charger, capital D, capital C. Excellent. The divine charger is impatient. Another term is here. Imagine Baha'u'llah as the commander in chief of the forces of light. He's waiting for his army of God to take the world. And he's waiting. He's like, come on, people. I, I, I sent the orders. What are you doing? The divine charger is impatient and can carry no longer. He's saying ours is the duty to do what? Rush forward. Rush forward. And ere it is too late, win the victory. So if anyone ever said, what is our role and duty in this day? What is our role and purpose? Our duty is to rush forward, not to tarry. Our duty is to rush forward, to, to teach with radiant acquiescence. <laughs> we got to be happy. We cannot be like, oh, this, this is not easy. I'm suffering. <laughs> or <laughs> we got to be rush forward, right? And finally, is this most stirring passage, which he, in one of his moments of exaltation, was moved to address to one of his most trusted and eminent followers in the earliest days of his ministry. So this is in more words of Abdul Baha. This is what he says. What more shall I say? What else can my pen recount? So loud is the call that reverberates from the Adha kingdom that mortal ears are well nigh deafened with its vibrations. And this is as real as John was saying. It's this language of imagery. And it's almost, it's not just um, symbolism anymore. It's almost becoming tangible in the sense that you are seeing it and feeling it because here Baha'u'llah, the, the, the Abdul Baha is saying the whole uh, kingdom on high is reverberating with the coming of the manifestation. And we, if we all recall the gospels, that when the manifestation of God, it would be this bugle, the trumpeters will blast, right? And the entire kingdom would announce the coming of the Lord. So, so loud is the call that reverberates from the kingdom, the Abha kingdom, that mortal ears are well nigh deafened with its vibrations. So not only this is not only in Christendom, in Christianity, in the Gospels, but also it's, this is uh, also in Islam, this talking about the trumpet blowers, this announcement that this uh, announcement from the heavens, the coming of the Lord, so the whole creation, methinks, is being disrupted and is bursting asunder through this shattering influence of the divine summons issued from the throne of glory. More than this, I cannot write. But he actually did write some more. So, <laughs> right? But the reality is, what an incredible paragraph set uh, here. Um, and we're going to go into it and uh, explore it into much greater detail, okay? So let's go through it, dear friends. So in this section, paragraphs 30 through 35, the beloved guardian is citing more statements uh, from the central figures. And this time he is pulling from uh, His Holiness Abdul Baha. Prior, he, he had pulled from the writings of the Blessed Bab and Baha'u'llah. Now he is... Uh, pulling extracts from His Holiness Abdul Baha on, on the nature and significance of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Okay. And these are the key points. The revelation of Baha'u'llah will be unique for centuries and ages to come. And the holy ones of past ages have yearned 
and are yearning to live in this day. And that's incredible extract that they would rush back into this life if they could, so that they could offer service at the threshold of Allah. An incredible uh, statement from Abdul Baha. The souls of those in heaven desire to return to the earth to attain to the threshold and to the revelation of Baha'u'llah. What an incredible statement. The glory of the revelation of Baha'u'llah and the call from the Abha kingdom have enveloped the whole of creation as well as the potentialities inherent in the revelation of Baha'u'llah will gradually unfold. So we've talked about this progressive revelation as a concept, right? This is one of the, as they say, one of the mm, main fundamental truths of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, fundamentals of what the faith stands for is this concept of progressive revelation, right? And we, when we, if, if someone asked, hey, Esan, can you please explain progressive revelation in a nutshell? I would say at different points, at different times, these divine lights have revealed themselves. At one point, it was His Holiness Jesus Christ. And another time, it was Muhammad. And in this day and age, it's His Holiness Baha'u'llah. And each one of them have revealed themselves at different points, at different times, for the edification of the planet at that point in time, okay? And, but it's not just that concept of progressive revelation. Also, the revelation itself is also progressively revealed. So this is also uh, to do with progressive revela revelation. So the, the revelation of Baha'u'llah is also being progressively revealed. So the potentialities inherent in this revelation of Baha'u'llah are gradually being unfolded. For example, if everything was made known in 1863 to those people surrounding Baha'u'llah in the tent of Rezvan. <laughs> so those, those humble, loving servants of Baha'u'llah you know, if everything, all the concepts and everything was suddenly revealed, I mean, Baha'u'llah, of course, could have done it, right? He could have revealed everything and told them everything how it's going to be. He could have just snapped his finger and said, this is it. But no, that's not how it is. So it's gradually unfolded. This entire revelation of Baha'u'llah is being unfolded like a carpet, just gradually opening up. And this incredible tapestry is uh, being unfolded. So this is the other aspect of progressive revelation. As well, this is an, another incredible paragraph, and we talked about in our last uh, uh, section on this new race of men. And we've talked about also in our la even previous one, talking about the station of the true believer. Now, the beloved guardian wanted to pull this extract in paragraph 34 is it no 33 in paragraph 33 the beloved guardian wanted to pull this extract from abdul baha to highlight the station of the true believer this is an incredible paragraph okay i read this uh again for you the station which he who has truly recognized this revelation meaning which revelation revelation of baha'u'llah so if you truly 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 recognize baha'u'llah and the station of Baha'u'llah. Remember, this is one of our fundamental purposes being born into this world, the twin duties, right? To recognize him. Twin duties, Kitab Ahdas, second paragraph, so that it means to recognize him and follow his ordinances, right? So twin duties. So if you truly recognize this revelation and will it, truly recognize this revelation will attain is the same as the ones ordained for such prophets of the house of Israel as are not regarded as manifestations endowed with constancy. So what does that mean? It means the highest station per se that you can attain is of the station of per se the lesser prophet. This is an incredible station such as Solomon, such as Isaiah, such as Daniel, and these incredible um, 
um, individuals that were not of the station of a manifestation of God, but of the station of um, from the house of Israel. This is if you attain that true station of a true believer. Okay, so this is an incredible um, um, station. And obviously, the only way you will know that you've attained that station is <laughs> in the next life, if he says you have attained it, because, you know, no one else can say, hey, you've attained it. So the, the reality is you got to work on it. You got to work every day to not only get to that station, but to maintain that station if we attain that. OK, so that is um, our task, truly. So also in these paragraphs, set, then we enter into paragraph 34, an incredible paragraph. Talking uh, and 33, talking about these future manifestations, right? Future manifestations in the Baha'i cycle will be under the shadow of Baha'u'llah. This is an incredible, another incredible con uh, uh, quote here from Abdul Baha. So, it, talking about this Baha'i cycle, showing that uh, and addressing. That Baha'u'llah, in that sense, we've talked about Baha'u'llah as the supreme manifestation of God, and this Baha'i cycle will last how 500,000 years, right? And so, uh, granted, yes, the Baha'i dispensation is no less than 1,000 years, but the Baha'i cycle is 500,000 years, and the future manifestations in this Baha'i cycle will be under the shadow of Baha'u'llah. The promised revelation of God has been delivered, and we should act now, as there is no time left for hesitation and doubt. This is that incredible paragraph, paragraph 35, where it says, there is no more time, there is no time to tarry. Not there is no more time, we should never tarry in the first place. It says there is no time to tarry. And so this is uh, in paragraph 35. So this is the divine charger is impatient and can, and can tarry no longer. So these are the main themes, dear friends, paragraphs 30 through 35. Now, let us get into um, our more detailed study as we always do. Now, before we get into this, any questions or thoughts uh, before we get into it? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. You sound like the wonderful lady from uh, from AT and T. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you finally. I'll mute now. Very excellent. Happy to be have you. Okay, so now we're going to get into our set. Okay, in paragraph thirty one in the opening. Okay, it says centuries, nay, ages must pass away. He affirms in one of his earliest tablets. Now, who, this is the writing of Abdul Baha, right? Ere the day star of truth shineth again in its midsummer splendor. So it's talking about summer, midsummer splendor, right? Or appeareth once more in the radiance of its vernal glory. Okay, so I pause right there. We're talking about the seasons. And this is not the first time we've, we've mentioned these seasons. So I wanted to expand on this theme so we can understand this concept a little bit uh, greater. That's how we do it uh, in the uh, this study, okay? So Abdu'l-Bah is stating, centuries nay ages must pass away ere the day star of truth shineth again in its midsummer splendor. This is a reference to the summer seat, the session of a revelation from God. The study of the past major religions shows that they have evolved and developed through the cycles of spiritual birth and decay in their lifetime. The cycles of birth and growth, maturity, and decay of a religion have similarities to the four seasons of the year. And we find this reference, this is a very interesting, and I encourage you to go to the sources and read this for yourself. I'm, I pulled this from Promulgation of Universal Peace. So I encourage you to go and read it, the whole talk in from Promulgation of Universal Peace. So I'm going to let our dear Farzad John read this slide for us. He's got a wonderful voice. Let us hear from him. 
Yes. Uh, four seasons of her revelation. This is described by Abdul Baha in the context of the spiritual cycle or four seasons of a religion. A new revelation from God goes through four seasons, four cycles, sorry. The first stage is the spiritual springtime when the son of reality returns to quicken the world of mankind. A divine bounty descends from the heaven of generosity. The realm of thoughts and ideals is set in motion and blessed with new life. Minds are developed, hopes brighten, aspirations become spiritual, the virtue of the human world appear with freshened power of growth and the image of likeness of God become visible in man. Excellent. Thank you, dear Vazir John. The other day, um, I and my wife planted some seeds because we have the expectation that soon it will be per se harvest for not only herbs and fruits and vegetables, but what was what is there right now? It's just soil, barren soil. Very similar to the winter season. There's nothing there. But what we did was we planted seeds into the ground. And this is very much similar to this spiritual springtime. When the coming of a manifestation of God appears, new life is injected into this barren soil. And this new life has suddenly sprung into the world, has quickened the world of mankind. And a divine bounty is descending from the heaven of generosity. What is this divine bounty? It is the rains. The revelation itself is now pouring and descended itself. So the realm of thoughts and ideals is set in motion and blessed with new life. Just like in the springtime, you know, April showers bring May flowers, right? So the heaven of bounty is pouring on the world. And so this is the first stage of a coming of a new revelation. Um, so this is the start of spring. So what comes next? The second stage. This is from Abdul Baha, the second stage. The second stage is summer of a new revelation. At this stage, the word of God is proclaimed. His law is promulgated and all things reach a state of perfection. The heavenly table is spread the breezes of holiness perfume the east and the west. The teachings of God conquer the whole earth. Souls are educated. Laudable results are produced. Universal progress is made in the human realm. The divine bounties encompass all things. And the sun of truth shines above the horizon of the heavenly kingdom in the height of its power and intensity. So this is when the faith has reached its highest zenith, its highest point, right? The word of God is proclaimed, his law is promulgated, and all things reach a state of perfection. So this is now the, per se, the highest state of the revelation at that point, the, during that dispensation. Then autumn comes. Okay, so let me get a reader for autumn. Okay, Rias John, could you read this one for us? The third stage is autumn. The third stage is autumn. Autumn follows the summer. This is growth and development are arrested. Soft breezes turn into blighting winds and the season of dearth and want dissipates the vitality and beauty of the gardens the fields and the bowers that is 
spiritual attractions vanish, divine qualities decay, the radiance of the hearts is dimmed, the spirituality of the souls is dulled, virtues become vices, and sanctity and purity are no more. Of the law of God, not remains but a name, and of the divine teachings, not but an outward form. The foundations of the religion of God are destroyed and annihilated. Mere customs and traditions take their place. Divisions appear and steadfastness is changed into perplexity. Spirits die away, hearts wither, and souls languish. Wow, wow. So suddenly going from summer to fall or autumn as the uh, Solonis Abdu'l-Baha mentions, this is a complete opposite stage of now there is growth and development has arrested, stopped. This growth and development has stopped. So the soft breezes are now turning into blighting winds, blighting, it's like pestilential. The season of dearth and want has dissipated. The vitality and beauty of the gardens, the fields, and the bowers. Suddenly, I'm, I'm the visual imagery. First thing I'm thinking is of the beauty of the gardens of Haifa, it's the surrounding, and suddenly they're turning into um, death and decay. And this is the imagery that's coming. This is the spiritual attractions vanish, divine qualities are decaying. The radiance of the hearts is dim and dull. The souls are dull. The virtues are now become vices. We see this um, in, in the, this is the, per se, the spiritual evolution of humanity. So it goes through a cycle and it reaches its peak. And now we're entering on this downward trend. But when we talk about um, let me have a, when we talk about also progressive revelation, I'm going to show you an image here. So I don't know if you can see this. Okay, there you go. Okay. Can you see that little kind of hump? Uh, kind of? Very faint. Yeah, it's very faint. Sorry about that. Okay. So it's, so it starts, it starts, you know, right there, okay? Let's say that's at the very beginning, okay? And then it enters into this, this is the spring, and then it goes, enters the summer, but then it enters the fall, and it looks like it's going to enters the winter. The winter is actually still higher than the, the beginning of the spring because of spiritual progress, right? They've... So even it's, it's, it's an arc, it's not a complete drop to lower than the very beginning, okay? okay? So it's an arc, it goes up, but it still has dropped, but then the next manifestation of God, it comes and then takes that one on a higher level arc. Do you follow what, I, I, what I'm saying? Um, let's, let me draw it with a pen so you can see this, because that was using a pencil, okay? So there you go. Okay. So here, so here, spring, spring, then it goes up, summer, and then and then it goes winter. So it has descended, so it has come down, but it's still higher than the spring. Okay, this is just a basic visual imagery, but talking about spiritual progress on and maturation of uh, the spiritual maturation and advancement of humanity going through the seasons. Because if, if it was always like, you know, coming up and then down, up and down like this, and then being at the same level, where would the spiritual progress be? I mean, we have reached the higher levels of spiritual progress 
than many generations and many, you know, ago. So it's not a flat up and then down, up and then down. It's actually, you know, at uh, an incline. So it's up and then at a higher level and then up and then coming down at a higher level. And then just like that. So it's always being talking uh, this progressive aspect of development of humanity over these uh, different dispensations. You follow uh, any questions? I don't know how clear I was in. <laughs> Please, Doug. To, to extend this just a tiny bit, this, Please. Now, this analogy, in the springtime, when you plant the seeds in the soil, the soil has an abundance of life in it in a dormant state. And, but the act of doing the planting and adding some water brings that to the life. It, it, it starts, it, it awakens things that are in the dormant state and becomes food and nourishment for the plants. Those microorganisms that are in the soil were the result of the decay of the previous cycle. And as every cycle happens, the soil becomes richer, ever more richer. And so that's an extension of what you're saying. Excellent. Wonderful, wonderful analogy. Exactly. Those, the decay of the past dispensation, per se, is actually the enrichment of the future, um, per se, the next one. And so it is building upon each one. And you cannot have one without the other. And so they're so excellent. Uh, and thank you. Very well uh, thought out. So now yeah. we move to the, per se, the final stage in uh, which is the winter. And this is coming from promulgation of universal peace. The four stages winter. Uh, may I have a question? Please do testify. Go for it. <clears throat> yeah, according to now, we are seeing all details of this uh, seasonal talk about by Abdul Baha. So to your opinion, what do you think about the best season to for teaching? Because when you see Ottoman is something different, everything is dying, no purity, sanctity, everything is so different. Is it, what does that mean to when you come to the teaching the faith? Is there any other better season for teaching? The best, it's season. a good question. It's a good question. I would say the easiest season to teach the faith is spring <laughs> because all yeah. everything is right. Yeah. I mean, because it now the it's it's just like you don't have to be a good gardener to garden in the spring <laughs> <laughs> because the entire world is ready for the flowers to grow. The world is ready for the fruits to come. So you don't have to be a very good gardener for, and just like the confirmations are pouring, the world is ready to, for this new springtime, the, the, the world is ready for, to cast away the, the deadness of the winter season and bring in this new um, garden of God that is uh, being poured by the confirmation. So it's per se, the easiest time to teach is the spring season. Sp summer is already, the world has, reached the plenitude of acceptance of the manifestation of God. It's reached its highest peak. And the autumn is when now mankind ha has already lost that connection with its Lord. And instead of turning to virtues, it's turning to vices. And it's losing that spirit of even faith and uh, um, strength in the covenant. And so there is there turning away. And this is where it says the soft breezes are turning into blighting winds. That is spiritual attractions are vanishing. So they're turning away from their Lord, even in the, in the, in the autumnal stage. So it's uh, almost a, a spiritual death stage. That's why now the leaves that were bright and, you know, on the tree of God per se, now they are falling off. And this is a, a stage of decay. And so, um, and then the fourth stage uh, is now this, this stage of spiritual death. This is winter. 
The mantle of winter overspreads and only faint traces of the effulgence of that divine sun remain. Just as the surface of the material world becomes dark and dreary, the soil dormant, the trees naked and bare, and no beauty or freshness remains to cheer the darkness and desolation, so the winter of the spiritual cycle witnesses the death and disappearance of divine growth and extinction of the light and love of God. So, to dear Tesfaye's question is, which would be the easiest uh, season to teach? It would be in a season where humanity is ready to hear the word of God, you know, and it would be in the spring season, which we are in. I mean, the manifestations of God have just come. We're, we're in the season of spring. And um, even in, in that quote of uh, paragraph 35, it says, the hour has come. <laughs> the hour, the divine charger is, is, is saying, do not tarry. This is the season. We're in the season of, of spring. We, how can you wait? And so, so this is, um, and because uh, that, uh, it's, it's just like you have the message of the hour. Why are you not proclaiming it? <laughs> so it's just really, that is that simple. So uh, that was a longer answer to your question, dear Tesfai. Thank you, anyhow. But uh, you know, one thing which I observe is from this revelation, every time that we are hearing a lot of words that uh, we are hearing, but uh, the, world is, the world is now is fed up of words. So we need example to show and that example is to be the one teaching humanity and taking to the next level. So we Baha'is have a responsibility for that to show in action. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the divine springtime, the Baha'i springtime could last several hundred years, couldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. When... <clears throat> When the dispensation of Baha'u'llah is no, no less than a thousand years, you know, if even if you broke down a thousand years into four per se stages divided by four, that's 250 years. And we, that's, we don't know exactly how many years the springtime is or the summertime or the autumnal season or the winter season. We don't know. And so, all we know is, is that we're at the very, very early stages of the spring season and that these, uh... Riaz John, please, you have a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to po point out and for our discussion or reflection that Abdul Baha, <clears throat> it, it seemed that uh, it seems to me that Abdul Baha is describing the known stages of, of the known, known um, uh, dispensations of the past, That's meaning right. of the prophetic cycle. He's describing perfectly the events of the prophetic cycle. Now, this is a new cycle, a new universal cycle. And Baha'u'llah is, is, is very firm in saying that this is the day. No, much followed by night. Be followed by night. Mm -hmm. So it, it personally, it seems to me, possibly this new cycle of fulfillment, but this is a cycle of fulfillment. Uh, and this fulfillment is, tends to infinity. Uh, so it is possible that Abdul Baha's description uh, fits perfectly to the prophetic cycle uh, whose, whose mission was different. Those were prophetic missions. Now here in this new universal cycle, there is a different mission. It's a mission of fulfillment and possibly <laughs> based on the, I've not seen anything pointing to a a downturn in, in, in the progress of this this revelation of 500,000, not less than 500,000. 
So possibly this new cycle is uh, in, 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 in dude, uh, has characteristics, new characteristics of the day that shall not be followed by night. Just my personal. Thank you very much, Rios John. Yes, um, the cycle, you're absolutely right, the cycle, but um, the dispensations themselves um, may, I, I'm not sure. And remember, the, uh, during the, the prophetic stage uh, cycle and uh, during those, um, the prophetic dispensations, um, those all had these four stages of spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And as we now are entering into this uh, dispensation of Baha'u'llah, um, these are the words of um, Abdul Baha, as I've cited them from in coming from some answered questions and promulgation of universal peace. I, I'm not sure, we're just at the spring stage. And as you correctly said, Rios John, this is a day that shall not be followed by night. And I, I don't know if we're going to have an autumnal and a winter stage. We will, it may be, we may always be just working in that spring and then enter into the summer. So, you know, and so it's, we're not there yet. So it's, uh, it's, we got a long way to go. So, but this is just, I, I wanted to, you know, highlight these seasons uh, of this revelation mentioned by uh, Abdul Baha. But great point, dear Riyaz. Thank you so much. Okay, so just carrying on, checking our time. We got uh, time. So as mentioned in these paragraphs, uh, paragraph 32, Abdul Baha is making a reference to the length of this Baha'i cycle which is different from the Baha'i dispensation, okay? So there's a Baha'i dispensation and the Baha'i cycle. In one of his messages, the beloved guardian in states, in spite of the vast spiritual significance of what Baha'u'llah has brought to the world, we humans have infinite progress to make in the future. Future prophets will bring us new laws suitable to our state of development and continue to educate us on this planet. But they will be under the shadow of Baha'u'llah for 5,000 centuries. This period of 500,000 years is referred to in the Baha'i writings as the Baha'i cycle. So 5,000 centuries, they will be under the banner of Baha'u'llah, under this shadow of Baha'u'llah, and this is the Baha'i cycle. But there will be manifestation of God after manifestation of God after manifestation of God after manifestation of God for 500,000 years. There will be, there'll be manifestations of God. So, so, um, so 500 more, because every one of them is a 1,000 years. So 500 more technically 499, right? 499 more manifestations um, will be under this um, Baha'i uh, Baha cycle, right? And they will all be af uh, after the, the, this Baha'i dispensation. And, uh, and they will all be under the banner of Baha'u'llah, under the shadow of Baha'u'llah. May I ask you a question? Please, here? please, go ahead. Yeah, so here when you are talking about the Baha'i cycle, mm -hmm. now is the Baha'i cycle is similarly as the Adamic cycle, but this one is a little longer to me, the way I see it. But we don't know how much is to be the Adamic cycle. Is there any number or figures that you find out from the writings or anywhere in your research? Um, we actually Adamic covered cycle. the Adamic cycle in a past session, um, dear testifier. Yeah, what I mean is the period. How how long? We is have that? that, and I will send I will send that to the class again as we covered that in great detail in a past session. 
I will send that as a, uh, to, to the class afterwards. Okay. okay. Thank you for confirmation of this one. Thank you. Okay, excellent. I just don't want to go off on another tangent on that, uh, going back to Adamic cycles and prophetic cycles and everything. Well, we covered that in a past class. I'll send that um, so you will have that. Okay, and moving on. So the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, on the other hand, is the period during which the laws and teachings of Baha'u'llah will be effective and will extend over a period of no less than 1,000 years. So if the, so it's saying no less than 1,000 years. So it could be 1,200 years. It could be 1,500 years. It could be 3,000 years, but it could be no less than 1,000 years, okay? So the dispensation will constitute the first stage in a series of dispensations to be established by future manifestations, okay? This is from the beloved guardian and it's found in Citadel of Faith. And then we move to paragraph 34, okay? Paragraph 34. His Holiness Abdul Baha mentions that the manifestations of God who appear after Baha'u'llah will be under his shadow. And in a letter written on his behalf, the beloved guardian explains, after Baha'u'llah, many prophets will no doubt appear, but they will be under his shadow. Although they may abrogate the laws of this dispensation in accordance with the needs and requirements of the age in which they appear, they nevertheless draw their spiritual force from this mighty revelation. The faith of Baha'u'llah constitutes indeed the stage of maturity in the development of mankind. His appearance has released such spiritual forces which will continue to animate for many long years to come. The world in its development, whatever progress may be achieved in later ages after the unification of the whole human race is achieved, will be but improvement in the machinery of the world. For the machinery itself has been already created by Baha'u'llah. The task of continually improving and perfecting this machinery is one which later prophets will be called upon to achieve. They will thus move and work within the orbit of the Baha'i cycle. So manifestation after manifestation. So as I said, <laughs> 499 or so, uh, roughly, give or take, you know, because some of these manifestations, no less than 1,000 years. So, you know, so they will all be underneath this, under the shadow of Baha'u'llah, right? And on the nature of the relationship between Baha'u'llah and the manifestations of God who will come under his shadow. This is an awesome extract from Adib Taharizad. Adib Taharizad explains that the future manifestation of God will build their teachings based on the fruit of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, which is the unity of mankind. He then continues, in dispensations to come, man as a result of the appearance of future manifestations of God, will continue to develop and progress. He will acquire noble qualities and will grow spiritually to such a degree that none today can visualize the heights to which he will attain. Yet he will function within the framework of the oneness of mankind established by Baha'u'llah and the manifestations of God who appear from age to age during the Baha'i cycle will remain under his shadow. So from age to age and all underneath a Baha the Baha'i cycle. So, and in the notes section of the Kitab Ahdas, the commencement of the 1000 years is considered to start from the first intimation received by Baha'u'llah of his supply mission 
in the Sea of Chal of Tehran in October of 1852. So that's when, per se, the clock started. <laughs> the Baha'i cycle started right then. The, uh, the, the Baha'i dispensation started, right? 1852. Uh, the commencement of the 1,000 years from... So that means it's not from the declaration of 19, uh, 1863. This is uh, in the notes section of Kitab Ahdas. Um, yeah, but, it's but from Bahar the first. There in 1863, right? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, but so... uh, it says uh, the commencement of the 1,000 years is considered to start from the first intimation received. It's when he says it, it came to me like a you know a, a found you know a, a flood of grace you know poured from you know from from my head. And this is when he was in the prison of Sia Chal, the black pit. And the, he's, he beheld the maiden, you know. And so this is in 1852. And so from that point, this is in the, the note section of Kitab Ahdas. That is when the dispensation of Baha'u'llah um, started. Good to know. Okay, moving on, dear friends, regarding your questions. There is no record in history or in the teachings of a prophet similar in station to Baha'u'llah having lived 500,000 years ago. So, <laughs> so I guess someone asked the question to the beloved guardian, was there another Baha'u'llah, you know, because this cycle is 500,000 years, was there a, one before that? So someone asked that. There will, however, be one similar to him in greatness after the lapse of 500,000 years. But we cannot say definitely that his revelation will be interplanetary in scope. We can only say that such a thing may be possible. What Baha'u'llah means by his appearance in other worlds, he has not defined as we could not visualize them in our present state. Hence, he was indefinite, and we cannot say whether he meant other planets or not. <laughs> I thought that was interesting to include, uh, being a bit sci-fi. That's a, you know pretty interesting. So, so uh, there you go. Um, a while back, uh, I heard an interesting talk by a counselor. Um, I'm not going to mention the counselor's name, but it was an interesting talk. And this counselor said, he said, Esan, do you know why the manifestation of God, God appears every thousand or so years? I was like, I was like, because, you know, humanity goes through these cycles that we talk, you know, that we mentioned today. It goes through the spiritual springtime. It goes through, you know, summer and winter fall. And he says, yeah, that's a great reason, right? You know, and I said, and I was, you know, I said, that's from Promulgation Universal Peace. And I was cited my sources, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, the actual answer is this, but I'm only going to tell you, Esam, don't tell anyone else. <laughs> but obviously I am, right? But this is what he said. He said, because the manifestation has got a lot of planets to go to. <laughs> so he's visiting all these other worlds. And by the time he's done his circuit, he has got to come back here. And so... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was like, okay, uh, everyone has their own thoughts on it. So, but it, it, this was uh, a, a fun answer that I heard once. And so, so yeah, uh, it's, this is uh, what, who knows what's going to happen well into the future with our technology. But, but this everything. revelation is on, not only for the planet or it's for the universe, right? Sorry, I, I missed, I just heard a few words from you. So One more time. What I mean is this revelation is come for, not only for the planet Earth, but for the universe. I, I, I. That's what it says in the writings. This, when you hear the universe, I cannot think any more outside of Earth right now, because that is our limitation. We don't really get off much of this planet, really. So our universe is really still this planet. And so, but yeah, um, I'm sure every one of these stars have habitable life and every one of these 
worlds eventually there will be life and we they will visit us you know and they may be holding back because we're still a warring species and they're just <laughs> <laughs> and so so who knows honestly who knows so anyway moving on now we're just getting to the last part of our section okay this is an in the incredible paragraph 35 in paragraph 35 his holiness abdul baha states the undying fire which the lord of the kingdom hath kindled in the midst of the holy tree is burning fiercely ours is the duty to rush forward and ere it is too late win the victory the potentials inherent in the revelation of baha'u'llah will gradually unfold as a result of our actions and the sacrifices we make for the baha'i faith hence it is urgent that we act to nurture the fruits of the revelation of baha'u'llah and this is from abdul baha arise o people and by the power of god's might resolve to gain the victory And I'm going to let our dear Farzad John read this one. This is um, an incredible uh, extract coming from the beloved guard. Urgency of our action. Shoghi Effendi explains, if we all choose to tread faithfully his path, surely the day is not far distant when our beloved cause will have emerged from the inevitable obscurity of a young and struggling faith into the broad daylight of universal recognition. Following the path of Baha'u'llah requires nothing less than full recognition of him, love of him, full submission to his will, dedication and commitment to his commandments and action according to his ordinances. This is not only our duty. Being critical to the advancement of the cause, but therein lies the hope, the salvation of mankind. Such implications clearly demonstrate the urgency, the sacredness, the immense immensity, the glory of the task we are expected to embark on. Thank you so much, dear Farah Sajjan. So in this incredible uh, extract we've, uh, in uh, Baha'i administration uh, from the letter of the beloved guardian, we see here this path of when we accept and recognize Baha'u'llah, this path of Baha'u'llah, the beloved guardian says, it requires nothing less than full recognition of him. First, you have to recognize him, full recognition of him. Then love him. So you recognize him here. You, you, the heart has to love him, pouring love. Then full submission of his will. His will, it becomes your will, full dedication and commitment to his commandments and action according to his ordinances. Then the beloved guardian says, this is not only our duty. It's not just duty. And, but what does he say? Being critical for the advancement of the cause. But he says, doing this is the hope as well as the salvation of mankind. So it's not just, yeah, we're going to help, you know, advance this Baha'i faith, you know. But doing this is the hope and salvation for the whole world. So you can see how critical it is. And then the beloved guardian says, these implications clearly demonstrate the urgency, the sacredness, the immensity, as well as the glory of the task you're expected to embark on. The whole world depends on it. The whole world. This is the words of the beloved guardian the criticalness 
And then this is, I believe, my last slide in this section of the criticalness of this urgency of our action. So I'm going to let my dear friend Doug, who is such a pleasure to have you tonight. So I'm going to let you read this slide. Go for it. Thank you. In another letter, Shoghi Effendi indicates that our sacrifices and acts of heroism in the path of our beloved cause should intensify as the international situation worsens, as the fortunes of mankind sink to a still lower ebb, as the fabric of present day society heaves and cracks under the strain and stress of portentous events and calamities, as the fissures accentuating the cleavage, separating nation from nation, class from class, race from race, and creed from creed. All the signs referred to by Shoghi Effendi in his message are very obvious in our society today. The principles and beliefs that for centuries determined the pattern of behavior of individuals, the integrity of the family and the community are either consciously ignored or unknowingly overlooked. The ideologies that for centuries have proved successful for groups of people or nations in creating wealth and improving material comfort are becoming ineffective. Disunity and division in communities, nations, and the world on the basis of race, language, religion, color, etc., are rampant. Such obvious and clear signs of destruction around us are strong indications of the urgency of our time and the degree of action required of us. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, dear Doc. The world is sick and every day is getting worse. And we have the medicine for the world. And it, it would be, imagine if we were a doctor and the, the doctor's, you know, code of, um, the, the code of a doctor is that if you have the medicine, you have to provide the medicate the medicine to the, you know, the patient, you know. And in the reality, we are withholding the medic medication at many a time. It says, a doctor says, thou shalt not do no harm. Our role is the doctor. We should not be doing harm. And often we are doing harm by not giving the medication for the patients. The world is sick. As we see, the beloved guardian is outlining the sicknesses, the calamities, the diseases that are afflicting the world, disunity, division. And all of these are also affecting our communities. We don't think about it, but they are also affecting our communities on a smaller level. And so we talked about that in much greater detail in, in the advent of divine justice. And so these are things that as an individual we should work on, as a community we should work on, and then through this transformation process, we, we will affect the greater society. And even at this massive level, I just want to share this one thought. This massive level of crisis that is afflicting, you know, the Russia and the Ukraine, you know, this incredible conflict that's going on. And I don't want to talk politics or crises and anything, but anyway, my, why I mentioned this is, because of a one quote of the beloved His Holiness Abdu'l-Bahá, where it says, "A thought of, you know, a thought of uh, peace should a thought of love should have, uh, oppose a thought of war." Right? Exactly. So, how much are our hearts burning with thoughts of love and burning with thoughts of love and burning with thoughts of peace? And how much are we talking about these concepts? I mean, think about the time of Abdu'l-Baha, His Holiness Abdu'l-Baha. 
when he was traveling, 1911, 1912, these shores of America, go read Promulgation of Universal Peace. When he was in, in Europe, in his, from Abdul Baha in London, Paris talks, what did Abdul Baha's most common talks on? Was peace. I mean, that means the Baha'is should be master orators of the topic of peace. <laughs> we should be the greatest public speakers on this subject. I mean, how could anyone argue about peace? Really? I mean, it's, it's I mean, really? I mean, the reality is everyone getting along, the world, you know, working together. These are common subjects. And Abdul Baha, I mean, most of his talks were on this subject, was peace. And so this is a common themed subject that in our gatherings, in our firesides, in our feasts, we should be giving this as a subject so that the Baha'i community learns as a subject to be able to speak well and knowledgeable about. So to give talks on the subject of peace. So then the Baha'i community will be known as a bastion of peace. And then they will turn to the Baha'i community and say, this is a community that has the answer for all these crises, these wars, these conflicts, these hatreds, these animosities to the world, because they are the ones that are speaking out and they have the spiritual solution to peace. But the vast majority of Baha'is I see nowadays are not often speaking on this subject. But His Holiness Abdul Baha, that was all he was speaking about for the most part of his talks. So as Baha'is, we need to, as they say, be look at me, follow me, be as I am. What is he speaking about? What is he doing? And emulate that example. So there was just a thought that came to me. But anyway, dear friends, here we are. I have, I have one question for you. Please, dear Tesfai. Yeah, because from your understanding and uh, what do you think that this uh, educated doctors and philosophers and then whatever material education they have a lot of degrees and whatever it is, do you think that to be that much contribution to the peace of the world of humanity? Education is what you do with it, you know, what if it is only to amass more letters in front of your name, and if it's um, and it's just to have you know write more and more books and letters and things and either to acquire more and more wealth you know whether it's you know a doctor or this or that what are do you do with that education not to benefit also not only your family your community and people around you Edu that is the purpose of education is to it's not only to benefit the individual and heighten your name and power and glory education is as a tool to unlock the the all the best you that you could be as well as education is to benefit society as a whole so what are you doing to it with all those gifts that you've unlocked with these titles to benefit society, you know? So for example, if you're a doctor, how can you be the greatest doctor to benefit the masses? If you are a teacher with a degree, how can you be the absolute best teacher to, to benefit the masses? It's not just about, you know, um, but there are uh, some degrees that may be, you know, as the uh, uh, His Holiness Abdul Baha says, might be, Begin with words and end with words. Have a degrees of, you know, just are just talk. You know, we want to, uh, professions of usefulness that can be of use for humanity, and this is something that we're uh, instructed to go towards that can be of benefit to humanity. This is um, of ultimate benefit. Uh, ultimate. Anyway, I did want to. Yeah, the, the reason that I ask you is because the world is getting better and the education is good and then technology is growing and everything, but humanity is still 
they are in hatred and then they are backwards in in other side of morality so what is the solution of getting education if you are not getting better the problem is not material education the problem is spiritual education the lack of spiritual education and this is the problem dear testimony is that in fact, many of these countries actually are very well materially educated. In fact, so they may actually be <laughs> have better material education than us, but they lack. In fact, the prayer to uh, uh, the prayer of America <laughs> in the prayer book it says, "Let this great um, American land uh, attain spiritual degrees as it has attained in material degrees." <laughs> right. So it's saying that this great country has attained incredible material degrees, which is true. But it's saying, let it also attain the spiritual degrees. Imagine what degree has, have, has America even attained the bachelor, per se, of the spiritual world? So, you know, or is it still at just trying to get through its GED? <laughs> you know, you see what I'm saying? So the reality is, is that to work on itself, you know, to as a as a mass population, as and first as a com Baha'i community, we have to achieve GED level, you know, you know, the Baha'i population has to be united and a force to be reckoned with as a united force to take on these long-standing evils that we talked about in Advent of Divine Justice, corruption, racial prejudices, and moral laxity and fight them with full force, with a rectitude of conduct, the chaste and holy life and freedom from racial prejudices. So we have to have this transformation of an inner life. And so through that, then we can take on these longstanding evils that have actually entered and permeated into our Baha'i communities. And so through this transformation, we can take on these longstanding evils, have a transformed Baha'i communities, and then these Baha'i communities can be beacons of light for the greater society. This is called the double crusade that the beloved guardian mentions in Advent of Divine Justice. So that was a longer answer. I apologize to your question. No, it's okay. Excellent. There we are. Those were paragraphs 30 through 35 uh, from uh, the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. I will send the slides and recording your homework for next week is paragraph 36 through 41, okay? Paragraphs 36 through 41 is going to be your homework for next week. And I will send that to all of you. And uh, before we go, we'll have our closing prayer. And who would like to have uh, share a closing prayer? And as always, thank you so much. And really wonderful to see you, Doug. And we, Miss Mary has her hand up. Thank you so much. May I share with you a recording of my husband reading a prayer over oh, two years ago? I love your husband so much. I say prayers for him often. Uh, I worked you. with him uh, in, in the oil world. So, yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Mary, I don't know how Hassan was hearing us on that, and he pulled the, the perfect prayer right there, right? Yeah. 
Thank you so much for sharing. Excellent. And thank you so much. And as always, wishing you all a wonderful night. All right. Look Good night. Good Have night. a great night, every one of you. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Be safe. Good night. Night.